Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Francis Colson. I'm a partner. Fifth session today. Uh, it's a very topical one, I think, which deserves the in-depth consideration that our speakers are going to give it today. Um, our speakers are going to present papers looking at the issues uh, arising in the public interest in dealing with large-scale insolvencies. Unfortunately, we've seen several of these uh, in recent years, um, and the economic and geopolitical scene is set for more, unless we're very lucky. Uh, the pandemic, the war, and the uncertainty in the East, rising costs of energy, and the issues surrounding climate change, amongst other things, are creating a dangerous environment for many businesses, including those of scale. We've got a number of illustrious speakers to give us their thoughts, and I hope to, uh, we can engender some debate around the topics. <coughs> um, We've opted for a three-paper format on the subject, um, and I'll introduce all the speakers at, at the start so, and their topics so that the debate uh, hopefully can just flow between, between the three papers. Um, so first of all, we're, we're going to have speaking on the, um, I would say, difficult case of <laughs> bag and pay operations um, by, the, by the team in the know, um, uh, entitled, Is it the Future of Trading uh, Liquidations, I think. So, from Clifford Chance, um, Melissa Coakley, Giles Allison, and Robert Davey. Um, I know Philip Hertz can't be here today. He's uh, also contributed to the, to the paper um, and his global head of uh, Clifford Chance's restructuring and insolvency group and also uh, contributes to the chapter uh, entitled Schemes of Arrangement in Tolly's Insolvency Law. Um, Melissa, I know, advises, on a, uh, uh, advises a broad spectrum of stakeholders on consensual and non-consensual cross-border restructurings, workouts, uh, reorganisations and formal insolvencies, and has had uh, a great deal of focus on the Middle East, having spent five years uh, on secondment to Dubai. Um, Giles uh, is a senior associate at Clifford Chance and has worked on such cases as Blackwall Football Club um, and uh, for creditors' committee in NMC Health, a very large insolvency with a, about a four billion hole, I think, <laughs> in creditor funds. And Robert Davies, also a lawyer at Clifford Chance, um, focusing on global financial markets, restructuring and insolvency. Following the Clifford Chance team, we're going to hear from Dr. John Tribe, uh, speaking on, and we've got to be able to pronounce this, communitarianism. <laughs> I think Mrs. Thatcher said there's no such thing as society, but I think we're going to hear that that's not, not, uh, not right. Um, and the public interest in large corporate insolvencies. Um, so John's a senior lecturer at Liverpool University uh, and is joint author with John Briggs at South Square of Muir Hunter on personal insolvency. Um, he advocates corporate insolvency approaches based on the timeline of insolvency and consensual restructuring. Um, and as his paper will no doubt demonstrate, an exponent of uh, progressive communitarianism. Um, and then finally, but definitely not least, Dr Peter Walton and Professor Andrew Kay will give their thoughts on large insolvent companies where the public interest is engaged um, Peter has taught at the University of Wolverhampton for over 30 years. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. <laughs> 35. <laughs> Professor of Insolvency Law and the Director of Insolvency's Law Research Centre. Uh, he's published widely and his uh, work is quoted in uh, numerous domestic and international <laughs> uh, insolvency courts. Um, he's, uh, he is co-author with his fellow speaker, um, uh, Professor Kay, um, of a, uh, Insolvency Law, Corporate and Personal, published by Jordans, and general editor of Totty and Moss on insolvency. Um, I know he's done several research projects for the UK government and the, and the profession, and the Kenyan government, and, and also for R3. <laughs> um, all the best players, yeah, all the best payers, yes. <laughs> um, and Professor Kay uh, is Professor of Corporate and Commercial Law at Leeds University, um, where he's been since 2002. He's also practised at the bar here after arriving from Australia, where he um, had a doctorate from Queensland University. He's also a prolific author, so we are, we are um, with the greatest of experts today. But I think I'll, I'll introduce the Clifford Chance first and Baglam Bay, so I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Francis. We're really delighted to be here today, so thank you to the Insolvency Service for having us. My name's Melissa, as Francis said, and I'm here with my colleagues Giles and Rob, and we're all from the Clifford Chance Restructuring and Insolvency team. And we're here today to talk to you about the Baglin case, where we acted for the official receivers and the special managers. 
By way of opening remarks, trading liquidations, whilst not new, have certainly come to the fore over the past two or three years due to a number of complex national interest cases, including British Steel, Thomas Cook, Carillion, and the case we're going to talk about today. Baglin itself is a really interesting and unusual case in its own right in terms of the factual circumstances leading up to the official receiver's involvement and the complexity of the task at hand in terms of needing to run the business for a period in order to safely decommission this heavy industrial asset. Where things got really interesting was the intersection with third parties who said that their interests, including critically their human rights linked to various environmental factors, needed to be taken into account by the liquidators when exercising his statutory powers. The ensuing litigation broke new ground in terms of judicial consideration of these issues, which leaves us to consider what is or is not the likely lasting impact of this case for future liquidations. And with that, I'll hand over to Giles, or Rob, <laughs> one of the two, to dive into it. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so just to touch on some of the background to the liquidation. So the case in question principally concerned the closure of the Baglan Bay Power Station, which is a gas turbine power station located in Baglan Bay, South Wales. There were four entities that were placed into liquidation for these purposes, but for the, key, the key entity for the purposes of this case was Baglan Operations Limited, as that was the operating company with respect to the site. No administrator or private liquidator would take on the appointment due to the potential environmental risks health and safety risks, and also a lack of realisable assets which could fund the liquidation. So accordingly, on the 24th of March 2021, Mr Gareth Allen was appointed as official receiver and liquidator with respect to the companies, um, being the liquidator of last resort, and Interpath, who were then KPMG, were appointed as special managers. By its nature, the liquidation was a complex affair, requiring a number of specialist advisors to formulate and enact a closure plan with respect to the site, in order to deal with the risks at the site prior to disclaimer by the official receiver using his powers under the Insolvency Act. The key asset at the site for our purposes was a private wire network which supplied electricity from a conduit point with the national grid at the Baglan plant to customers in the local energy park and it was the only source of power to that energy park. The power station operated on the basis of old and redundant technology and as such ceased operating in July 2020 Nevertheless, it continued to supply customers um, throughout the point up until the liquidation and then on an interim basis from the commencement of the liquidation. The slide behind shows a timeline of liquidation up until the initial hearing. I won't dwell on it in too much detail given timing, but just, just to touch on a couple of the key points. So firstly, the liquidation commenced in March 2021, as mentioned. At that point, customers were notified that supply would only continue on an interim basis. <coughs> From the point of the commencement of the liquidation, the official receiver and the special managers formulated and enacted a closure plan with respect to the site. By November 2021, the official receiver was aware that power would cease in, in January 2022 due to the fact that power would not be required at the Baglan plant and therefore could not be on supply to customers. Customers were duly notified in mid-November 2021 that that was when the power supply would cease. Just, to, just prior to the intended switch-off in January 2022, um, customers brought applications for injunctive relief to stop the official receiver switching off the supply, and the applications were subsequently heard at the back end of February 2022. By way of background to the applications, there were five applicants for the purposes of the proceedings. The first two applicants were Council General for Wales and the Welsh Ministers, and they brought the applications due to their regulatory functions as the government for the locality, and they also brought an application on behalf of all customers of the Baglan Energy Park. The remaining three customers were all, the remaining three applicants were all customers of Baglan Operations Limited. These were Welsh Water, Neathport Talbot Council, and Sofidel. <coughs> Welsh Water and Neathport Talbot were both statutory undertakings that operated sewerage and flooding pumps in the area. Sofidel were a commercial third party who ma manufactured tissue paper in the locality and, op and accounted for 90% of the electricity supplied by Baglan Operations Limited to customers, so they were the overwhelming customer. <coughs> the applications were made under Section 1685 of the Insolvency Act, seeking in order to modify the decision of the official receiver so as to require him to continue to supply electricity until an alternative connection could be established. <coughs> 
Giles will now talk you through some of the arguments that the parties raised in the proceedings. Thank you, Rob. <clears throat> now, the key issue in litigation concerns the official receiver's ability as liquidator to carry on Bold's trading activity. Paragraph 5 of Schedule 4 to the Insolvency Act 1986 states that a liquidator has the power to carry on the business of the company so far as may be necessary for its beneficial winding up, the statutory power. It was pursuant to this statutory power that the official receiver was able to continue the company's supply of electricity to its customers after the liquidation commenced. So the court in this litigation had to consider to the extent of the statutory power whether a decision to exercise the statutory power should take account of wider circumstances and issues that did not immediately affect the liquidation of the company or its creditors, and whether in the circumstances it was appropriate for the court to reverse or modify the OR's understanding of how the statutory power should be exercised. Now, the applicant's position was that the official receiver's decision to stop the supply before a new supply had been put in place was wrong and resulted from a misunderstanding of the scope of the statutory power and how it should be applied when exercised. The five applicants advanced different arguments initially, which had largely coalesced by the time of the hearing. Now, their position centred around the potential health and safety risks that might result from the cessation of supply. For example, if the electricity supply uh, was turned off before a new collection was in place, Welch Water would not be able to operate its water pumping stations, so creating a flooding risk. And it was not possible, they argued, to move to diesel generators in the interim because that would affect air quality. The applicants argued that the official receiver was a core public authority for the purposes of the Human Rights Act 1998 and had not taken this consideration into account when deciding to switch off supply before a replacement connection was in place. Now, Section 6.1 of the Human Rights Act states that it is unlawful for public authority to act in a way which is incompatible with the European Convention of Human Rights. Public authority for these purposes is defined to include any person certain of whose functions are functions of a public nature. The applicants argued that the official receiver was a core public body for these purposes. Now, taking the arguments in turn, Welsh Government pointed to its own statutory responsibilities in relation to flooding, water and air quality, the local economy, the local community, and said it could not meet these statutory uh, obligations and responsibilities if the electricity was switched off. It argued that various convention rights were contravened by the decision, not least those relating to the right of life and the right of property and the protection of property. It was also argued that the official receiver had failed to consider the effect of Section 149 of the Equality Act 2010 and the OR's decision uh, and had not undertaken a uh, equality impact assessment. This made the decision to terminate supply unlawful as the official receiver had ignored its duties as a public body for the purposes of the Equality Act. Now, Sofidel, as a core customer, argued that it had a choice of either closing its factory at a risk to hundreds of jobs and goodwill, and it argued that the latter goodwill was protected by Article 1 of Protocol 1 of the European Convention of Human Rights, or moving to temporary diesel generators, which, as I've said, would have put Sofidel at risk of breaching uh, air quality regulations and being found liable as a result. Neathport Talbot Council and Welsh Water both again pointed to the risk of severe flooding and pollution risks that would arise if the pumping stations could not operate, particularly given the time of year, it was winter, early spring, there were lots of storms and flooding was a real risk. A further issue um, was the need to ensure the continued provision of street lighting around a local school and ensuring that children were not at risk. Now, as a general point, the applicants argued that insolvency law had not developed in line with concerns around the environment, local communities, and health outcomes, which are very prominent in public discourse today. And they said, in those circumstances, the OR's interpretation of the extent of the statutory power was too narrow, and it should take account of the wider concerns that the applicants had identified. Consequently, the applicants said it was just for the court to exercise its discretion to reverse or modify the OR's decision. Now, the respondent's position was relatively straightforward. The OR and the special managers argued that the electricity supply had been maintained whilst it was needed to wind down the company's operations. Once the point was reached where the liquidation itself no longer required any electricity, the OR was entitled to switch off the supply. The statutory, statutory power, we said, does not permit the continuation of the company's business for any other purpose than other where it was necessary for the beneficial winding up, 
that's what the statutory power says. And we argue this has to be considered with reference to the company and its creditors and not external issues that affected other persons. Consequently, the OR could not continue to supply electricity just because third-party customers wanted that supply to continue. And this position was referred to by the judge as the orthodox view. Now, we also argued that the Human Rights Act was not triggered at all because the official receiver was not carrying out public acts in this instance, but rather was acting as the liquidator of a company in a private capacity. If anything, the OR was a hybrid of these two things. And there were other arguments advanced as to whether the applicants were actually victims of a breach of convention rights, and so whether they had standing to bring a human rights-based argument anyway. Rob. Sir Alston Norris handed down his judgment on the 21st of March 2022. Sir Alston Norris's judgment focused largely on the scope of the statutory power and not the human rights issues raised by the applicants. The judgment does deal with those issues, but not in great detail. Firstly, the judgment states that the official receiver's interpretation of the statutory power accorded with the orthodox view. However, in certain circumstances in which an official receiver had been warned of the inherent risks posed in his decision by statutory undertakings, that in those circumstances, he did have the power to take into consideration those risks when determining whether to continue to trade a company's business. However, Sir Alston Norris noted that the official receiver need not have carried out a broad, wide-ranging environmental survey to determine the exact scope and nature of those risks. Nevertheless, with regard to Sofidel and the position on commercial third parties, Sir Alston Norris preserved the orthodox view. He stated that in those circumstances, the official receiver did not have the power to continue to supply a commercial customer, as in doing so would place the interests of that customer above a company's creditors and also noted that it was a regrettable feature of an insolvency that the collapse of a supplier could occasion stress to its customers. Most importantly, Sir Alison Norris confined the decision to the facts of the case, and in doing so dismissed the applications, but also modified the official receiver's judgment, such that he should continue to supply electricity only to Welsh Water and Neathport's Harbour, being the statutory undertakings who operated the pumps, and only up until the 18th of April 2022. That date was quite arbitrarily chosen, but it was chosen on the basis of the fact that <clears throat> a change in weather would mean the flooding risk would have minimised, and also sort of brighter evenings would have posed less risk to some of the issues with street lighting that the applicants had raised. So just to touch on some of the practical consequences of the judgment. Firstly, who does this judgment apply to? So clearly in this case, the application was brought, by the, brought against the official receiver, and as mentioned before, no private insolvency practitioner would take the appointment. And it's notable that in the judgment, Sir Alison Norris does emphasise some of the sort of public protection aspects of the official receiver's role, and certain of the arguments raised possibly do lend themselves more towards an official receiver appointment. For example, in particular, some of the human rights arguments that Sir Alison Norris doesn't analyse in as much detail as the statutory power arguments. However, the statutory power analysis is relevant to private liquidators and clearly continued trading can occur in private liquidator contexts. Therefore, it's possible that the door has been opened ajar with this case such that in future cases it may be applied in those private liquidator contexts. I suppose there's a question as to whether in that circumstance a private liquidator would be likely to take the appointment. Where there's such broad, wide-ranging environmental and health and safety concerns, it tends to be that those are liquidator, um, official receiver liquidator appointments. And therefore, it's possible that this judgment may discourage private liquidators from taking those sorts of appointments further in future. There's also potentially a degree of uncertainty as to how liquidators should conduct liquidations as a context of this judgment. As far as to Norris, in particular, emphasised that in this case the official receiver was appointed to deal with health and safety and environmental concerns at the site, and not necessarily for the benefit of financial creditors, given there was a lack of realisable assets at the site, and therefore very unlikely to be a distribution to the creditors of the company. He therefore said in these circumstances, it would be odd if the interpretation of the statutory power would be such that it would create extraneous environmental risk beyond the Bagland plant when the official receiver was appointed to deal with environmental risks. However, there's potentially an alternative view in the way in which we look at the liquidator appointment in this case. So as Norris looks at it beyond the Bagland plant, however, alternatively, the liquidator was trying to minimise those risks for the companies and the environmental risks for the companies 
such that there was less um, impact on the estate of the companies and also less risk for the official receiver at the point at which he disclaimed the site. There's therefore uncertainties in this judgment as to whether liquidators should be inwardly looking at the assets of the company and minimising the risks attached to the company or whether they should be outwardly looking to the broader locality. And this judgment doesn't answer those questions, it merely poses them. Where there is a degree of certainty which is welcomed is in relation to commercial third parties in preserving the position with respect to Sofidel. However, with respect to the environmental risks which are more uncertain, there are some potential um, sort of points of emphasis in that judgment which could be quite useful for future liquidations. For example, Sir Alison Norris makes a lot of the fact that the risks were raised by statutory undertakings, i.e. parties who are, very, who are responsible for the very risks that they raised. This therefore suggests that it has to be raised by a credible third party who's able to sort of stand behind the risks at which it puts before a liquidator. However, of course, that could be quite fact-specific in different circumstances. The second interesting point is Sir Alistair Norris majors on the fact that these risks were actually brought to the official receiver's attention. This therefore suggests that liquidators perhaps have a reactionary rather than a proactive burden to try to sort of find out these risks. They should merely react to risks that are raised in front of them. However, in confining the judgment to the facts, it's possible that in other circumstances it may be more proportionate for a liquidator to do a broader assessment of the environmental risk beyond a particular site. But that could very much depend on sort of the nature of the risk, the impact it would have on the liquidation, both in terms of timing and the creditors of those, of those companies. So whilst the judgment does say the official receiver or a liquidator does have the power to continue to trade, potentially in circumstances of environmental risk, it remains unclear in, to what extent it would be proportionate for him to continue to trade in those circumstances. And it's important to know uh, to note that an official receiver and a liquidator must still make an assessment, even if he does have the power, to determine whether continued trading is justified in those circumstances. And because of that, on a practical note, it's, it's important that this judgment emphasises the importance of stakeholder engagement in trying to understand those risks by speaking to people in the locality <laughs> speaking to local governments, speaking to the council, speaking to statutory undertakings to determine the nature and extent of those risks. But that in turn places a burden on statutory undertakings to sort of look into those risks, assess them, put them in front of a liquidator, but put them in front of a liquidator with sufficient evidence for a liquidator to make a judgment as to what is proportionate in the circumstances of that liquidation. Um, Giles will now run through some of the other practical consequences out, arising out of the case. Yes, just running down <clears throat> factors on the left-hand side of the side. Um, the court considered the funding of a liquidation to be a very important factor. Um, as is common with national interest insolvencies, the official receiver in this case has the benefit of an indemnity from base. However, keeping the supply going was costing several hundred thousand pounds per month, and while some of those costs were being met by customers, the balance was being met by the base indemnity. Now, agreement during the course of the hearing by Welsh Government to provide its own indemnity in respect of the ongoing supply costs, apart from those incurred in respect to the Sofidel, appeared to be a key factor in the court ordering the supply to continue, as this meant there was no direct cost to the estate. Therefore, in other cases, the court's decision may depend on the extent to which external funding can be provided by the third parties who are complaining of the action, uh, or whether the provision of such funding is reasonable in the circumstances. Another feature was the impact on secured creditors. There was no realizable assets for the secured creditor in this case, whose recoveries from the liquidation um, would be minimal, such that the judge did not have to consider competing interests between the secured creditor and the applicants. The fact that there was no detriment to the secured creditor of bold continued trading no doubt assisted the court in finding that the supply could continue for a limited time. Therefore, the position of any secured creditors is likely to be a key point of distinction in other insolvencies. One might expect that it would be more difficult for the court to arrive at a decision that has the effect of putting the interests of third parties ahead of those of secured, uh, the company's secured creditors, but again, this judgment opens the door. Now, the case also provides, to be blunt, an example of how the litigation process in itself can result in a positive outcome for third parties, irrespective of the court's determination of the merit of the issues. Injunctions were obtained at the outset that prevented the respondents from switching off the electricity as planned. Those injunctions remained in place from the 13th of January until the final hearing in front of Sir Alistair Norris on the 28th of March. As the judgment was appealed, those injunctions continued um, until the appeal had been determined. This provided sufficient time for a new connection to be installed, so rendering the litigation otiose. 
without the Court of Appeal hearing the case. Finally, does the decision make itself make it more likely that office holders might proactively go to court themselves prior to the commencement of third party action? If there is any uncertainty over the extent of the statutory power or how it should be applied in a particular liquidation, um, can a liquidator, uh, a liquidator can then apply for directions under section 1683 of the Insolvency Act. Now doing so immediately upon appointment might, re might well result in a quicker and cheaper determination of the issue than waiting for third parties to commence their own application in their own time, so allowing the liquidator to retain some element of control over how the ensuing litigation pans out. Yes, sir. So where does this leave us? To draw together the strands of some of what we've just talked about and to sum up, we just wanted to leave you with a few concluding thoughts. Was this a just and equitable outcome in the circumstances? It was undoubtedly a really difficult case in terms of the facts, and certainly the official receiver was very sympathetic to the plight of local businesses who needed an electricity supply. But it's often said that hard cases, frankly, make bad law. And the judgment was clearly a noble attempted judicial balancing act. It was plain that the judge had little time for the human rights aspects raised by the applicants, but he did have more sympathy with the alleged environmental harm that could have arisen due to a lack of power supply to the local area. The outcome of the judgment was primarily a confirmation of the status quo vis-a-vis -vis commercial third parties, but also, as we've discussed, there was a limited expansion of the liquidator's powers, limited to this case, such that where specific environmental risks were brought to his attention, the liquidator did have the power to consider them, even where those risks related to third parties and property or assets outside of the insolvency estate and which other statutory bodies had legal responsibility for. The question is, will this decision remain confined to the facts as was clearly the judicial intention or will its ramifications reach further? It leaves a number of practical unanswered questions. How will a private liquidator look to navigate similar risks? Where assets associated with any environmental or health and safety risks are involved, as we said earlier, does this mean only an official receiver appointment is ever feasible? Does it mean that, as Giles mentioned, to avoid litigation by stealth, parties involved in complex cases such as these will have to seek early directions around the scope of the power or obligations to third parties and will this in turn lead to a judicial overhaul of, for example, environmental law seen through an insolvency lens, especially given the societal, economic and cultural shifts which are apparent in our everyday lives, including as a result of climate change and other environmental concerns? All of these questions remain unanswered, at least until the next complex industrial asset enters insolvency. And with that rather gloomy statement, <laughs> I will leave it for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any questions from the floor? Yes. You might need a microphone. For the online. <laughs> um, the customers of the electricity, did they offer to pay a massive premium to enable it to continue and so there was something in it for the OR? Or did they expect to receive the electricity at the rack rate they were paying before? They did. They received the electricity at the normal rates, but obviously with an additional cost to cover the expense of the continuation of the power. But I think it's really important to remember in this case, it was, so, it was factually so unusual in that this power station didn't generate electricity. It was just the conduit for supply in the local area, almost by accident that it was kind of the connection for the, lo for the locality to the power. And the only reason that power actually was continuing to be supplied throughout the liquidation was because power was needed on site to decommission it. I mean, that was the only way we could even... I'm just thinking if I was a liquidator and I could make a half a million, million pound profit by but, supplying electricity, then I might have done that. But that's not permissible. In terms of trading for the, the benefit of winding up of the company, cases tell us that you can't trade for profit. You have to be doing it to further the winding up. So it's all about getting to the terminal conclusion of the liquidation. Everything you're doing has to be leading towards that. We were already stretching the power right to the south edges by allowing the on-supply, 
whilst we were decommissioning the site. In some ways, the official receiver was being a good public servant to try to help the area, and in other ways, it ended up <laughs> that, that that sort of generosity almost was, you know, in the end, abused. As Melissa says, the electricity had to be bought by the OR from a private supplier, mm -hmm. and given what we've seen with gas and electricity prices over the past few months, the OR would be in a very difficult position of being exposed to that kind of volatility just because third-party customers were insisting that the supply continue, even though there was no purpose to the state in doing so. And cost coverage was a really key part of the judgment as well, and Sir Alston Oris only allowed continuation of power in the circumstances, provided that adequate cost coverage was given to the official receiver, so it was subject, for example, to an indemnity from the Welsh Government that had to be agreed after the proceedings as well. So obviously, sort of, whilst we couldn't necessarily trade just for profit, cost coverage became a really key point in this judgment. Question over here. Two questions over here. Lovely. Andrew Shaw from the Insolvency Service. Um, this is just a speculative question, and I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts in their head on it. It's something that came to my mind um, as I was observing from the periphery of the of the Bagan Bay case. Um, there's some previous case law, I believe, um, on business rates, actually, involving schemes that were set up, artificially constructed, to enable uh, companies to continue in liquidation, essentially, um, in order to avoid business rates. And it's all quite uh, shady and dubious, but the eventual case law on that seemed to be that if there was an eventual payoff for the liquidation of a liquidator at the <coughs> end of the process by delaying keeping the liquidation open for several years, for example, then that was actually permissible under the law because it was still beneficial winding up to enable that eventual payoff to be there. So I was wondering at the time whether or not something could have been constructed to enable the liquidator to continue to keep the electricity supply going on the basis of an eventual artificially constructed bigger payoff at the end for the creditors or if that would have been still I mean, impermissible. It's possible, but I mean, in this case, there was going to be no return to the creditors, which was an important factor. Also, I guess you have to take into account that this wasn't a business kind of trading widgets. It was high voltage electricity coming onto the site. We had a skeleton staff remaining who were all looking for other jobs. You know, it was actually, there was quite a lot of risk associated with keeping this site open. And, you know, it was manifestly the job of the OR to effectively shut that site down in a safe way is the overriding objective rather than, you know, the, the power and the fact that it was part of this circuit and an on-supply was very much an ancillary part of, of that role. Presumably it all depends on the appetite of government to um, have deep pockets to cover the indemnity. Um, I think there's one more question over here before we move on. Hi, it's Inga West from Ashurst. Um, I, the, the, the point about wider purpose of the liquidation... I think in the judgment, it looks like that came from the base indemnity, which talked about sort of environmental protection. Would it, would it be possible in future cases to just be very careful with the drafting, uh, which might have shut down that argument? I think it or would, or would, he, would he have interpreted that anyway, do you think? I think that it, it was something that was picked up by the judge in this particular case, and he did use it to found part of his decision making. And, and Rob mentioned mm -hmm. that in, in his part of the session in terms of in future, it may be something to think about in terms of how the appointment role and purpose is formulated and, and sort of the parameters of the mm. indemnity. Mm. But I think, frankly, it was it was kind of latched onto by the judge as part, you know, almost as part of his reasoning. I don't think it was necessarily going to be a, you know, the judgment wouldn't have turned on it, let's put it that way. I think he was looking for reasons to try to find you know, it was a very difficult case, and he was almost looking for reasons to be able to justify a kind of balanced outcome, where I think he actually, if you read the judgment, it, I think it's clear that his favour very much fell on the orthodoxy as a general proposition. Mm -hmm. The drafting of the judgment or drafting of the law? The, the Bayes indemnity, Bayes indemnity. Oh, and also the, and the scope of the appointment papers themselves that talked about the, per the purpose of the, of the liquidation. Now we've got a few more questions online, and I've got a few questions, but I'd better not answer them now because I ask them now because we're under strict time instructions. So thank you very much for that very interesting um, uh, discussion on Bag and Bang. Thank you. Hand over to John. <laughs>
Thanks very much. I'll just get the uh, blooper thing. Uh, right. So, let's see if that's gone the right way. Oh. That's it. Oh. There we go. Right. Thanks very much. Sorry about that delay there. So, I'll hopefully uh, be able to keep within time. It's quite a big paper um, that I've been writing for a while on, in terms of scope, but also content. So I'll try and distill it as best I can uh, and also explain the, the title, the rather wor wordy title. Um, it's actually a paper for uh, an editor collection that Jason Harris at Sydney's writing on a research agenda for, sorry, editing, a research agenda on insolvency law going into the future. So taking on the conference themes of uh, forward thinking, I, I, I'm not operating in decades. I've gone all kind of uh, corporation soul and gone into, well, centuries. Um, so it's the sort of a view, if I was to encapsulate the, the paper in its entirety and distill this abstract into a, uh, a, a, a pithy phrase, it would be, really what would the corporation look like in 200, 300 years or so? And what does the roiling cauldron of insolvency teach us about what that entity might be like? And it's, of course, the pressures or the, the nature of public interest insolvency that I've taken as my inspiration for drafting the paper. And Inga West's excellent paper last year on a similar topic, that's to say public interest insolvency. Because, of course, as the title suggests, it seems to me that it throws up a number of issues around bankruptcy theory that relate to the well-known theory of uh, communitarianism in bankruptcy, which I'll get to. So I, I'll only talk to a couple of these because of time, but obviously it's an axiom in our subject that these public interest insolvencies, depending on how you define public interest, have been present in English and Welsh insolvency law for a long time. Um, my favourite case of all of them really, is Olympia and York. And we, you, know, you can certainly say that that reconstruction that uh, was undertaken there from you know, partially built structures over in Canary Wharf, certainly before it was, uh, had gone through an insolvency process, had potential. It had a form of value that perhaps we, we now see a, as a real testament, arguably, to the rescue culture, plus the $1.2 that the government put in to, of course, build the Jubilee Line extension. So I think Olympia and York's good in terms of rescue uh, techniques, of course, using what was then a new procedure administration, or well, indeed all the procedures, CVAs, liquidation, etc. Um, but it shows us that sometimes it's acceptable, or at least has been the case, that in England and Wales we have pumped in money in certain circumstances into insolvencies where, government money, into insolvencies where we have broad public interest issues. Another one I'll just, I'll just say for now, of course, is MG Rover. Uh, and, of course, there we can think about Longbridge, where the government pumped in seven million to keep wage bills ticking over for a, a, a week or so. So a bit like I've argued before you before in terms of eternal recurrence or plus chance, it's certainly the case that over time we've, we've seen, and most recently seen, of course, public interest insolvencies uh, causing issues or at least headaches for Paul and his team and his predecessors in terms of thinking about exposure and it's that that kind of you know, messy situation that Paul and his team might be faced with that got me mulling on well why is it the case that the government need to mull on these insolvencies isn't it the case that the the system itself is set up to to undertake you know, the kind of uh, activity that's needed? Or are there some kind of other pressures that, that Paul and his predecessors and team would have to deal with? And there, of course, the perception issues that we've seen with some of these cases. So, for example, Thomas Cook, you can't have a government just leaving its citizens stranded in other jurisdictions. We must do something to get them back. But are there, in addition to that, more technical areas that we might think about within our provisions that might give the team pause for thought. And I think there is, particularly in the realm of disclaimer. So I won't go through the minutiae of disclaimer. You're all familiar with it, of course, on the personal and corporate side. Save to say, of course, there is a bit of an issue when you're thinking about post-disclaimer responsibility when you've got certain species of asset that still have burdens attaching to them. 
We've heard about some environmental issues earlier with our friends from Clifford Chance. I was thinking more about, in this context, with what I've been calling the dangers of a sheet, uh, the idea of mainly freehold property uh, 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 and the idea that sometimes freehold property might have to be managed by the government because of some issue with that freehold property. Why, you might say, would the government be saddled with that responsibility? Well, it is because of the doctrine of a sheet. So, Professor Fletcher, uh, in his monograph, uh, uh, certainly referred to onerous property uh, as some form of volcano, kind of tinkering away in the background there, or, or being some sort of pressurised environment that might explode. Of course, for the government, because of a sheet, it is... Uh, uh, a, uh, a potential danger that I think they should be wary of in terms of freehold estates. Why? Well, because, of course, in due course, let's say it's uh, uh, the cladding issues that we've seen recently, they might have an entity to deal with that, of course, has onerous cladding obligations that they need to uh, make good and manage in some way. So just briefly... We know that in terms of a sheet on the freehold side, there's relatively little authority. There's a, a, quite a dearth of authority on the point. But His Honour Judge Malcolm Davis White QC, using some other uh, authority in terms of government guidance, has talked about here, as you can see in the quote, the idea of the Crown taking responsibility for that asset, whatever it might be. And as I've said... Broadly speaking, this seems to be freehold property that, that has, in my article anyway, some exposure. Leasehold, of course, just is subsumed into the, the uh, freehold estate. So if you're thinking about the sort of patterns and movements, if I had drawn a cunning diagram like our friend earlier had with his timeline of uh, phoenixism, the timeline would, of course, be leasehold property into freehold and then freehold into the crown. And it's there that it's residing and where it needs to be dealt with. So, it is a danger uh, because of the way in which people, namely the government, will have to deal with that kind of exposure, as well as that public perception point I've made earlier that might cause people to think about uh, uh, the risks that are involved. That's the first part of the paper in extreme outline. Uh, the second part of the paper of three parts is this. So I was thinking, well, you know, if you're going to have a situation where you've got an entity that's passing into some sort of insolvency procedure that's got broader, what we might call public benefit or, or the fourth pens or head, those of you that are familiar with charity law, kind of public or community interest elements that relate to that entity. What can we find in the literature that helps us think about how that juristic person, that thing, is managed and perhaps more appropriately in the context of our conference, how it exits an insolvency. In other words, can you look to the literature and justify some form of management that goes beyond pre-entitlement, let's say, pre-entitlement creditors' uh, dues, uh, and go out to further types of stakeholder that might be uh, appropriate for you to think about? So, obviously, we would go back, well, I went back to 1932, to the seminal debate between... Professor Merrick Dodd, that's him at the top there, uh, and then Adolf Burl, that's him at the bottom. And you'll remember in the article exchange in the Harvard Law Review that they were discussing this question. For whom are corporate managers trustees? Something that Professor Key has dwelt on at length in a number of his uh, publications and monographs over time. What was particularly interesting to me, of, particularly in relation to Merrick Dodd's article... And that's where he rebuts the profit wealth maximisation point that had been made previously by Adolf Burr. What Dodd, Dodd does, and I'll read this to you from the article, is say this, quote, The law is approaching a point, a view which will regard all business as affected with a public interest, close quote. And the reason he argues that, of course, is because Dodd is trying to locate that entity within a given environment, within a society in which that entity sits. And it's not, therefore, in his view, and indeed mine, the case, you might argue, that the entity is a profit wealth maximising, or to use modern language, enlightened shareholder value creating engine of capitalism. Instead, perhaps it should exist in some broader way, which, as Professor Dodd argued, uh, 
benefits the society because it's that society that, of course, has given it life, has given it that ability to transact and do things perhaps that go beyond profit wealth maximisation. So I start there in part two, but then I move forward and start to engage, obviously, with bankruptcy scholarship because that's uh, what the paper's mainly about. So then I start to take us down a road of thinking about incursions where we go beyond Jacksonian approaches to creditor wealth maximisation instead start to think about alternative theories. And, of course, that's Professor Warren uh, in the middle. You'll know her, obviously, as Senator Warren now, uh, where in 1987 in the Chicago Law Review she starts to of course, introduce questions of distribution of risk amongst stakeholders other than those pre-entitlement creditors that we've been thinking about. So that's the first stepping stone that gets me towards other scholars in the early 90s, like Professor Gross, as you can see here. But there's others, Donald Karobakin, for example, that argue, of course, that that multiplicity, that broader swathe of different stakeholders that we might think about beyond both the pre-entitlement creditors, but even... Uh, uh, of course, stretching into the community as a thing, as a, uh, like in South Wales, as we saw earlier, as, as a recipient of what that entity should be doing or what that insolvency law should be driving us towards is a perfectly legitimate goal of that insolvency law. Some of you, no doubt, this might come up in the questions, might critique me on, on the point of communitarianism and Professor Gross's work and ape the kind of critique that her work came in for from people like Shermer, who argued, obviously, that having this sort of indeterminate group of stakeholders was vague, was uh, uh, inconclusive, was internally incoherent, because how does a decision maker decide between the different types of stakeholder that isn't either the shareholder or the creditor? Uh, and that would get us into a, a realm of difficulty. My answer to that, and this is uh, at the moment speculative, perhaps we can debate it in a moment, is there are other areas of law that deal with uncertainty. I mentioned trusts earlier, charitable trusts, but of course we can think about mere powers in terms of distribution. We can think about discretionary trusts and the way in which we have the given postulant test. So if it's good enough for the House of Lords in the early 70s, some 52 years ago, to say, right, we don't know who a given group of individuals is, but we can see who a given postulant is through evidence. Why can't you apply that kind of discretion exercise in the stakeholder debates that we're thinking about now? Uh, and I would, of course, argue that, well, you can, and you should be able to. It's a long-held technique. If you didn't do that, you could perhaps come up with a presumption that the other stakeholders, we might call it the community, should be a stakeholder that was paid attention to because it's presumed that there's going to be harmful effects on, perhaps in South Wales, the local community, or going back to Longbridge and MG Rover, employment prospects in that part of Birmingham. So we could use, perhaps, forms of discretion or forms of presumption, uh, generally speaking. So that's uh, a bit of scholarship there. This then takes me to the third and final part of the paper, where I... This is into the speculative. So, uh, you know, this is the 300 down the year uh, road position where I start to think about to what extent are we going to start seeing entities, perhaps, that do reflect Professor Dodd's earlier view of that entity existing in that society, not just for profit wealth maximisation, but for those broader objectives to reflect the fact that it's that society that's given it life as a privilege. So when I talk about value here, I'm not talking about, of course, value returns to creditors or shareholders. I'm talking about the values that we think the objects of that entity should be driving towards. And it's why in this part of the paper, then, I start to mix up types of different entity and come up with this common wheel undertaking. And essentially what that is, it's not really anything new. It's just a reflection of either social enterprises as entities that have objects that are broader than profit wealth maximization, and then things like community interest companies. Because I'd argue that, of course, the apotheosis of rescue in this context must be, for example, the idea of rescuing a charity and its public benefit purposes to achieve public benefit aims. Similarly, if one was to employ that kind of thinking in, the, in a broader realm, 
we start to get, I think, to a more beneficial outcome generally that perhaps reflected what entities might be doing. Um, again, it's not new. Uh, other than community interest companies and uh, uh, charities, of course, you could also point to medieval guilds as the kind of thing that I have in mind when I'm discussing the Commonweal undertaking. Okay, so to conclude, uh, I think that public interest insolvency certainly raises questions about what the nature and function of our entities are for, generally, these structures that we use. Uh, of course, I think communitarian and bankruptcy policy most uh, recently, uh, as I've demonstrated, espoused by people like Karen Gross or Donald Korobakin, map neatly and nicely onto these kinds of policy concerns that we have and help justify perhaps why it's appropriate for government to intervene in the way it has in the past and might do in the future. Uh, 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 and in so doing, of course, then in the future, when we're forward thinking, we might start to think about other types of entity that can undertake, well, general work and activity. Okay, thanks very much. That was a whistle-stop tour in the time allowed. I'm open for questions either now or later on. It's, I think uh, questions now would be good. There is one online which suggests, uh, says, how would an office hold a balance the interests of creditors in line with their duties and public interest matters? To which I would like to add, um, if the uncertainty of who, uh, who forms the relevant um, stakeholder is to be determined by discretion, um, does that substitute judicial decision-making for political, democratic policy-making? Yeah. Yeah, so... That's the stickiest part of my paper, and the one that actually I've uh, I, I've sort of delegated to a uh, oops delegated to another um, paper, which is I've entitled it um, "Resolving the uh, Well the Uncertainty of Communitarianism in the Sense of You Know Who Might Be a Recipient of Value uh, or or Director Activity." Um, some of the principal objections to Professor Gross's work uh, were, well, one of them, Shermer, is that was a judge. So he, he was straight down the line of what you've suggested of, uh, you know, is it appropriate for that judge to be making business-related decisions amongst this multiplicity of wow. potential stakeholders? And anyway, even if I can, how can I weigh up the, the relative stakeholders within that group of stakeholders? Um, as I said earlier in the talk, trying to head this off, obviously not sufficiently satisfactorily, uh, I, th I think uh, discretionary trusts, you know, cases like Regal, Benkian, McPhail and Dalton, Rebad and Number Two, these are all high-level House of Lords authority, as it then was, for the idea that if you don't know who your potential uh, beneficiary of a trust is, there are techniques that enable one to be able to ascertain that individual's uh, appropriateness to fall within a distribution from that discretionary trust. Um, that kind of thinking, I think, perhaps could be deployed. Whether or not that's the office holder or some hypothetical judge uh, it is you know, a, a point for debate. Um, uh, perhaps judges in 200 years' time will have a different uh, function than uh, they do now. Um, thanks very much. Yes, Thanks, John, for, uh, for that. So it produces some interesting thoughts, and it's a real uh, launching pad for a debate. Um, one of the things I'd just like to ask you, and I don't think, I'm not expecting you to come up with some new view sort of, uh, you know, answer to this because it's not an easy one, but mm. given the communitarian push and the need for stakeholders to be taken into account and the balancing that so many people talk about, and I, I have myself, how can this be done, do you think, in a, uh, an insolvency context? Hmm. Uh, well, um, if I was going to hazard a guess uh, or uh, make a stab at it, I suppose the, it would be incumbent either on the office holder in a given procedure, perhaps a new one that might be discussed in due course uh, shortly after me, uh, to make those kinds of decisions or ultimately if there's dispute over how that decision is made members of the judiciary um, but, but it is absolutely the uh, well the problem that undermines all of communitarianism and well arguably pluralism as well perhaps why we you know continually go back to um, our familiar tests like shareholder wealth maximization or creditors wealth maximization but the point of the paper, really, in this regard of kind of 
you know, well, what are we doing within this roiling cauldron, as I called it, is recognising that there are other interests that the government are seeking to placate. So either that's employment in Longbridge, as we said, or finishing hospitals off with Carillion and something like that. We know there's a track record of decision-making that has placated people other than pre-entitlement creditors. So perhaps we could go back to previous examples, or in due course, and this is for our you know, predecessors in 200 years, think of, um, our successors rather, in 200 years, think of ways in which that entity is established and how that entity transacts and moves so that perhaps it isn't the case that, uh, as Dodd perhaps would argue, that it's set up to make redress or profit wealth maximise for shareholders, but instead just has much broader functions in its nature generally, mu much like the medieval guild. Um, uh, yeah, I'm a bit conscious of time, so I don't want to... One, any hard questions or two encroach on... Uh... I may be being a bit simplistic, John, yeah. but as an office holder and an official receiver, where it comes down to mm. for me is it's a lovely idea, but who's mm. going to pay? Yeah, you know, yeah. In a case like the Rutherford group of companies that Mark mentioned earlier where I'm the liquidator, yeah. there was no funding from government. Yeah. So, and I had to make decisions about disclaiming yeah. assets that have gone to the freeholder, yeah. but if those freeholders go into liquidation, we're yeah. in a different situation. Yeah. But that, that's the thing. So the government could either, with free, uh, a sheet, the problem with a sheet, as I foresee it, with it being the case that either the government can make the decision at the front end and be like, right, let's pump in some money into MG Rover because we'll keep that entity going and we'll ensure that employment and all sorts of other things occur. Or, ultimately, if it does go down the, the, the process that you've just outlined and it gets to the point that the government has to deal with that a sheeted, disclaimed property, uh, property anyway... <laughs> They're still, if they choose to manage that, is there is a, uh, an operative decision. But if they choose to manage that estate, uh, that freehold property, then um, uh, of course they're expending money then anyway. So they might as well have done it at the beginning like they've done in MG Rover, uh, etc. So yeah, it is government money and it is um, uh, 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 how you choose to spend that government money. I won't dare make a side uh, point around... Uh, control mechanisms over certain loan periods and I better stop there then so yeah hopefully that uh, answers you. your question thank you John I think we're going to move on now okay very thanks very much very so now over to professors Walton and Kay uh, thank you Excuse me while I work this out. <laughs> yeah, I'm not that just okay. Um, well, Pete Walton and I are going to do a double act today. Um, there have been some really remarkable double acts over the years. Uh, Lauren, and, <laughs> Lauren and Hardy, uh, Adam Costello, Martin and Lewis, Walton and Wise, Bike and Bernie Winkie. Who's the buffoon? So you can make that decision at the end. It's, uh, it's, 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 thank you very much for inviting uh, us to come here. And it's good to be presenting with my good friend and co author and erstwhile colleague, Pete Walton. Um, and thank you to Sarah for uh, liaising so well with me in uh, getting this, 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 this whole thing going. Okay. Well, what we'd like to do is try and hit some of the high points of the paper we've written. Obviously, we can't uh, cover everything, and that basically is sort of a, uh, uh, essentially, code for, uh, well, if I don't, don't cover it, you won't, you won't be too concerned about it. Um, so, let me just start with the, hopefully, no, it's down, isn't it? The food. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. The other way, the other way. Oh, it's not coming down. There we go. That's just to remind us who we are. Okay. It's a tough life. Okay. We've already sort of set the context of this paper with the, the paper that we've, we've, we've brought to us by Clifford Chance um, earlier on. 
Um, we've got a load of companies now, well, not a load, but quite a few, that have been large companies that have become insolvent and there's a public interest factor involved and we've got some of the companies there on the list and you're well aware of them where the OR has been appointed automatically to wind up the company. And in looking at these, when you first look at them, you sort of think, well, maybe these should have been candidates for administration. Now, there's obviously reasons why they didn't go into administration. So I won't go into detail, but obviously secure creditors wouldn't fund their administration, or administrators wouldn't take it on because they were scared of the environmental and other uh, possible liabilities. <laughs> So companies were put into liquidation with the idea that they would carry on business. Oh, I'm Goodness me. This is part of the going for you. Do you want me to for you? No, I'm not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So He's yeah. totally thrown me now. What am I talking <laughs> about? <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to go? No, no. The companies were, 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 were put into liquidation, essentially to carry on business, as we know, with what happened with Bagler, and of course, more, more, more directly with British Steel, which I'll come in a moment. It's interestingly, interesting that we, we, we noted that back in 1988, uh, uh, Kenneth Cork, in a, in a book, after we delivered the um, uh, the court report said that uh, liquidation chosen, even though the Kenneth Court said. Interest, the government should take a hand. So he was sort of envisaging that administration would be used to deal with these companies that are um, affecting the national interest in some way, the public interest, and uh, they should go into administration. Now, the aim of our paper is to examine whether compulsory liquidation is the most appropriate route to be taken with respect to these large insolvent companies that are engaging in business which are not essentially public interest companies, but they impact on the public interest. Their actions intrude upon the, uh, the public interest. And if not, what other approach might be uh, appropriate to be implemented? Now, what we're doing is not talking about public interest companies per se. We want to make that distinction, such as the water company, the railway company, and so forth. But as I say, those companies whose actions, their businesses, might in some way uh, affect the public interest. Now, we start by looking at liquidation, and this is very brief because most of you will be aware of, of, of many aspects of liquidation. Um, but arguably, the leading purpose of liquidation is that it's a procedure to prepare or provide for the equitable and rateable distribution of a company's assets amongst its creditors. Collective regime, share the pain, something we were told to do yesterday. And uh, we're all familiar with that problem of, of, of insolvency that basically no one really wins. It's a matter of who loses the most. Now, obviously, this is all achieved with a liquidation by sending off the assets uh, as... Uh, expeditiously and as profitably as possible. So we've got liquidation there, and this is obviously the regime which has been used in these companies that we've, we've already referred to. Now, administration and special administration obviously have come in in the last 20 years. Well, administration is 86, but we, we all know that it wasn't used that much. But with an ordinary administration, if you say, well, let's, let's look at using administration. The problem with that is that the administrator has the duty to act in the interests of the creditors. There's no public interest obligation on him or her in the work that they do. Now, we know that certain companies in certain categories have been identified as public interest companies. And so special administration... Uh, procedures being introduced and has been used on a number of occasions over the years with uh, various public interest companies 
uh, that uh, have become insolvent. So those are the things that have happened in the past. And what I wanted to do was to have a look at British Steel, which is obviously one of those companies that was a large company which did enter liquidation uh, as a result of its insolvency. And I won't go into the details of it because many of you will know the facts of the case. Essentially, we're talking about a big company, 4,000 employees. It was insolvent or very nearly insolvent if it wasn't. Uh, Mr. Justice Snowden sort of said it was, in, it was one or the other. Um, the company was losing money. It would had real problems in selling its wares because of Brexit, because of competition problems. Also, there was less uh, of a market for the, the, the assets that it had. So it was also in default of its funding arrangements. It had uh, failed to meet the uh, money that it owed to the asset-backed uh, lending facility holders and also it had not been paying out on a revolving credit facility. Sorry, I've forgotten that one. Now, the company held cash for less than one week uh, when it got to, the, uh, got to the courts before Mr Justice Snowden, and the asset... Uh, based lenders were the only people who would have been able to appoint an administrator out of court and they didn't want to because they didn't want to fund it and two of the big four had refused to take any uh, appointment as administrators because of the potential uh, health and environmental issues that they were concerned about. Obviously this company had real problems in the sense of how it actually carried out its business as far as environmental issues are concerned. So the directors uh, petitioned for its winding up, uh, an unusual uh, action but not unheard of, and it came before Mr Justice Snowden as he was then, and he noted from the evidence that this company uh, really, with its actions, there was a risk of gas explosion, there was a risk of flooding, and there was a hazardous uh, amount of well, there was materials on site that were hazardous to life and limb. So this was a company that had the potential to have a significant impact on the, on the uh, public interest. Just as the Baglan situation, you've got the similar situation here. So the upshot was that uh, His Lordship made the relevant order, the OR was appointed, and special managers were appointed because of the need for special assistance, specialist management of the company. Now, now I've done it again. Here we go. It's trying to have the two things. Goodness me. I know now why I can't chew and eat gum at the same time. Now, the issues that we see coming out of British Steel are... I think, go further than the British Steel case itself. Now, the focus was, with British Steel, carrying on a business and securing a buyer. And there wasn't any concern about what the creditors would get because they said, well, the creditors aren't going to get anything. Well, they certainly weren't with the, with, with, with the business continuing because the funds were going to be exhausted in the running of the business. Now... Unlike administration, the carrying on of a business isn't the norm. But we know that it can happen. Schedule 5 uh, of, uh, sorry, paragraph 5 of Schedule 4 to the Act allows the liquidator to do so. And, of course, that was what happened with the, with the Baglin Operations case. So normally a company operations would be terminated as soon as possible because of the problems of spending money on it. And to save money for the creditors. That obviously wasn't going to happen with British Steel. Now, there are cases, when you look at the case law that we've got, that indicate that liquidators can take into account the public interest. And I've given you one decision there of the uh, Privy Council. Um, and, and, and what... Uh, um, 
the, the, uh, the lordship said in that particular case. But the important thing with that case was that the public interest actually emerged during the liquidation itself. It was not, if you like, the raison d'etre for the liquidation, as the British Steel case was. So you had in British Steel the company going into liquidation uh, as a result of the fact that there was a need uh, to uh, some way keep this company going to be able to sell it to a buyer, well, it was hoped anyway. So are we seeing, we ask, whether with cases like British Steel, Carillion, Thomas Cook, etc., etc., at the dawn of a new age where liquidation is employed, uh, where there is a distinct public interest factor, some intrusion in the public interest possibly, uh, and that is really the essential rationale for the compulsory liquidation uh, commencing. Now, one potential problem with that is what constitutes the public interest. How long is a piece of string? Uh, last year, some of you may have been at the uh, Insolvency Lawyers Association conference, and we looked at that issue and probably didn't get very far, because it's a hell of a difficult issue to deal with. What is the public interest? It's a slippery concept and very difficult to define. So that's one problem. The second problem is if a judge is to go and make a winding up order on the basis that the company uh, is in fact impacting the public interest and there's a need possibly to run the company, sell it in an orderly way. How serious does this effect on the public interest have to be before an order is made? Does it have to be a little bit or a lot or where's the line to be drawn? Another issue is can the OR conduct the, the liquidation with a focus totally on the public interest issues and totally eschew creditor interests completely. Now, obviously, in Baglan, the, the OR was trying to <laughs> basically walk a very difficult line. And I think um, Sir Alistair Norris, in his decision, was also trying to do so. And there's no doubt that both he and uh, Mr Justice Snowden made decisions which were very practical and very reasonable in the circumstances. But they do cause one to ask these sorts of questions uh, about the future and about the use of liquidation in the future. Um, are the interests of creditors to be sacrificed on the altar of the public interest? Is liquidation basically to occur at the public expense because there's a public interest matter? And I throw it, I throw it out there, I've got to. What about the secure creditors? They seem to get away with possibly all or most of what they're owed, is it time to revisit Buckler and Talbot for the future? But that's just thrown out there as a, an idle thought. I'll hand over to my uh, esteemed colleague to take you through the rest of it. Now, it's downwards, okay? I had no problems with it, but I'm sure you might. Huh? Hundred percent so far. Oh, but why am I holding it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, there's there's one. Uh, it's a, it's always a great pleasure to, to work with Andrew. I, sh I should probably say that uh, uh, before uh, before I'm insulting of him. Um, so there's one other um, thing that we're looking at in the paper before I wrap it up. Um, and um, we thought we'd uh, give our paper a, a sort of thin veneer of uh, historical relevance by looking at some old stuff. Um, <laughs> apart from ourselves. Um, and um, <laughs> as many of you are aware, are aware um, w when we had sort of public utilities um, before we could have registered companies, so before uh, 1844, um, if you wanted to form a company to run a railway or a tramway or, or a cemetery, I, I found quite a few cemetery cases, which, which I found um, kind of weirdly entertaining being married to a vicar. Um, uh, as well as some other things. Um, th th that's what passes for entertainment over our dinner table. Um, and um, 
the, the great thing about these things is they, they, were, they were all created by their own private act of parliament, and they all sort of, um, sort of danced to their own rules, and they had their own, uh, their own uh, um, constitutions, their own act of parliament to govern them. And all of that stuff, as you probably are aware, was standard, standardised and codified uh, in, in the Company Clauses Consolidation Act. Um, but what we're most interested in here is the power to borrow. And the power to borrow uh, that existed in Schedule C to the 1845 Act, uh, talked about being able to mortgage the undertaking of the company. And uh, what that meant was, in terms of these types of public interest companies, so these companies that were <coughs> formed to carry out this public interest construction uh, or whatever it was that they were doing, um, it was deemed to be a security interest over the business as a going concern, and there was a public interest in the, in, in the going concern continuing. And so the way that was interpreted by the court, so the sort of leading case is the Gardner case, the Court of Appeal case, is that the mortgagee couldn't enforce uh, that mortgage uh, whilst the company was a, was a continuing business. So, so you, you could enforce it in the sense that you could get a receiver over the income of the undertaking, but you couldn't actually sell the assets of the, of the undertaking. So you couldn't get a receiver and manager to sell the assets and pay off the mortgagee. All you could do would, would be to get a receiver over the income. And so the way in which that was described in Gardner was um, you, you could have the fruit from the fruit-bearing tree, but you couldn't chop, chop down the fruit-bearing tree. That's the sort of imagery that uh, we enjoyed in the 19th century. And so the court sort of protected uh, these types of businesses. Uh, and, and, and obviously, uh, Lord, Lord Justice Linley, as he was, uh, made the same point uh, in that case, which uh, um, I won't read out to you, but basically he's just saying, if, if, if you've got a statutory company, uh, you can't kind of uh, enforce the sale of the, uh, the company's business. Um, obviously, when registered companies came along, uh, once we started to be able to form companies for any purpose, not just for a statutory undertaking, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, those sorts of companies use the same term. So that's why we have a charge on the undertaking, and that's why we have the leading case of Re Panama, which is deemed to be the first case on sort of floating charges. And the idea here was that the, the meaning of the undertaking meant that you couldn't, uh, you couldn't enforce the charge whilst the company was the concern, but as soon as the company breached the terms of the debenture, as soon as they breached the terms of the mortgage or charge of the undertaking, you could enforce it. And so you could chop down the fruit-bearing tree, and therefore um, there was no reason why you couldn't enforce that. So, so there was a distinction between uh, the statutory undertaking, which had to be protected, and you couldn't break it up and sell off piecemeal, and companies that were just registered under the Companies Act, which didn't have that statutory protection, and therefore could be, uh, uh, have, have a receiver and manager appointed and could uh, have the whole thing uh, sold off. So, um, <laughs> so uh, that's sort of part of our reasoning. I'll, I'll try and make that clear in a minute. Um, so, so where does that take us? Well, um, just to recap on the current, op current uh, options that, that Andrew talked about, um, <laughs> you, you may not have followed what he was talking about, but it was something like this. Um, uh, so uh, at the minute, our options are, well, we could go into, we could go into compulsory liquidation, uh, but the problem with that, as Andrew sort of, he went, he went on a bit, I thought about it, but basically what he was saying... <laughs> What he was saying was that, uh, uh, you know, the purposes of a liquidation, uh, you know, um, you, you, know, well, you know, you've got to bear in mind the creditor's interest. That's the whole sort of purpose of liquidation traditionally. You can't sort of do that. And in administration, ordinary administration as well, you've got paragraph three of Schedule B1, same sort of deal. Uh, you owe a duty to the creditors. So, so liquidation and administration aren't really designed for the sort of companies we're talking about. So we're not talking about the public utility companies where there might be special administration already. We're talking about... Uh, uh, you know, British Steel and, uh, and the cases that Andrew uh, mentioned. Uh, so obviously special administration uh, looks a bit like a kind of an echo of the, the old public interest statutory companies in terms of uh, the idea of special administration is to try and keep the business intact, find a buyer for the business, keep the thing going in the future. So, so that sort of operates in the same sort of field as, uh, as our special administration regimes. And the special administrators is there to try and keep the company's undertaking intact uh, and encourages the sale of the undertaking, generally speaking. So it works but it only works where it's available. So it works where there's a public utility and you've got a special administration regime uh, already in place for that. Um, but it doesn't work with the sort of companies we're talking about where there isn't a special administration bespoke in place. So to get to our, the whole purpose of our paper, our proposal is something like this. Well, first of all, as a sort of an aside, um, if you look at all the different special administration systems in, in place, um, there isn't sort of always uniformity in terms of how they're drafted. So we could have some sort of uniformity around special administration. So that might, that might be nice. It make my life easier, because I, I couldn't understand some of them. Um, but I understood the ones I understood, if you could base it on the ones I understood, that would be quite helpful. <laughs> um, so uh, each case could effectively um, use the same rules. That would make things easier for some of us. 
Um, we could obviously wait and have sort of piecemeal expansion of special administration, and that might eventually spread to all sorts of uh, uh, public utility type industries, which is sort of where we're heading at the minute, perhaps. However, um, it won't cover uh, the companies that, that we're talking about. So where the public interest is, is not an inherent part of their businesses, but it's engaged where the business begins to fail. And so, um, so here we are, uh, final slide. A generic form of special administration we think might be kind of fun, so it sort of builds upon the idea of the, uh, the 1845 Act where we have a, a, a single sort of statute designed for, for all businesses in that sort of field. So have a sort of generic form of special administration available. Uh, a couple of bits and pieces that um, you might find slightly controversial. Uh, the Secretary of State could recognise a public interest in a particular case and could apply for a special administration or be heard on an application for special administration. Um, because we've got a standardised sort of form of special administration, we've got a standard form order available to the court, so that makes the court's job a bit easier um, And uh, if, they, if, the, if the court agrees that a public interest is engaged. Uh, and the purposes of the special administration will obviously be identified in the order. And there'll be various <laughs> ancillary matters that you might, uh, you might have to include, uh, such as obviously the government indemnity for fees. There seems to be fairly standard practice. Uh, other liabilities, who's going to be the administrator and so on. And um, going back to, to where Andrew started, this is, this is what Sir Kenneth Court would have wanted, uh, possibly. Um, <laughs> and um, we're open to questions. Andrew has all the answers. We've finished. Thank you. Stephen, question. Um, Peter, you mentioned, and um, your predecessor, Andrew Key, touched upon, I thought, um, almost, the question of public interest petitions. There's public interest there in the Insolvency Act already in the form of 124A, which obviously comes to mind, um, you know, the Secretary of State's capacity to wind up a company in the public interest, which you know, is almost the point you ended on, Peter. I mean, do you think there's anything in that sort of line of thinking that might um, inform the sort of line of thinking you're now embarking on? We, we did actually, we, in the paper, in the long form, we do actually deal with it. But it's, it's briefly, because we, 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 we had to do, as you just, I think, noted, we had to, to at least tip a, a, a cap to it and say, OK, we've got 124 capital A. Can this possibly work? The problem with that, of course, is that that usually is invoked where there's some improper activity going on, for the most part. And we are not suggesting that anything improper has happened in the companies that we've looked at, or maybe in the future. It's just, you know, it's just happened. So we did think about it, but I think I think it's fair to say we sort of dismissed it after after running it past our thought process, for what they were, anyway. It's good to have you back online. Yeah. In terms of categorising Baglan, obviously a case quite close to my heart, would it change your view in terms of there being a public interest if you focused on the fact that 99% of the power was drawn by one commercial business? Do you want to answer that? Uh, is it my turn to answer a question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know what the answer is, um, so you um, answer it, no, it wouldn't change our, our, our general views. Um, I think, didn't you say um, hard cases make bad law? So I'd turn it back around on, and say that you've answered your own question. <laughs> um, which isn't a, very, uh, isn't a very clear answer. Um, I, I guess the point we would make is that it, it's, up, it's up to the court to decide where the public interest lies. So if the Secretary of State's involved, which obviously they are involved in these compulsory liquidations, it's up to the Secretary of State to make the point that the public interest is engaged, and then it's up to the court to then say, well, actually, we don't agree or we do agree. So, so I think you'd end up with a, with a similar result um, through, through that route. Um, I, I don't know if that, that's a slightly more serious answer to your question. Let's do it. I just wanted to echo what this lady said before. When you're in office, you've got to do your statutory duty. So if that's realising for the benefit of creditors and you want to put someone ahead of that, then legislation is going to have to come in and say and if you've got uh, an ability to to nominate something as public interest when it's not before and that public interest obligation means you need to look after this category of people more than the general body of creditors that will then have a knock-on effect to the funding of that entity because people won't want to lend to a company that might become a public interest so I think you'd, you'd want to be able to categorise them from the outset so then when lenders knew, they knew what they were lending against. <laughs>
Interesting. Your turn. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting point, Stu. Um, it, it's, it's something that obviously is a concern from a practical point of view, which I don't know whether we've actually thought through uh, in our thinking. But obviously the difficulty is actually categorizing somebody, some, some company as a public interest, or, or even affecting the public interest, because we all know that businesses can change their, uh, their direction at any time, quite legitimately, particularly the way articles of, of association are drafted now, or memorandum are drafted. So, uh, so yes, it, it, that would be problematic, I suppose. Um, and I don't know how you get around that, because the, the, the fact of the matter is that, as I said in one of my questions, how far does it have to impinge upon the public interest before you say that it should be wound up as a public interest winding up, if you, if you like? I mean, I don't think it doesn't necessarily change what's currently happening, does it? In, in, in terms of if you've got some like Carillion um, or, or, or one of the other cases, would, would, would people were lending to Carillion, even though I mean, it went the way it went, and even though the government had to step in and, and pick up the tab. So <coughs> would, it, would it make any difference? It, it, it might do. Um, whether you could be too explicit about where the public interest um, lay in terms of trying to define it in a statute, that might be a bit fiddly. But keep it nice and vague. Um, the, the, the sort of leaping off point was um, the, the IP, private IP wouldn't take the appointment. But I, I think there are sort of the two separate points about whether the IP would take the appointment and, and funding is a sort of different bucket. But do you think that if you create this sort of new category of um, sort of uh, sort of general special administration, I, 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 I think I mean, special administration is not very special anymore. We've got yeah. too many of them. But anyway, but if you create a sort of general bucket of special in, mm. interest case, does that let IPs off the hook a little bit too easily to be able to say, I, I just don't, don't want to take this. We'll take it if we'd make it a special one and somebody else pays. Well, I mean, it's a good point, I think. I mean, it's easy for me to say, because I'm not an IP, but, um, I mean, the fact of the matter is we have, to be, we have to be practical and say, well, look, no one's going to take this. So how, what are we going to do in the circumstances? So I just think it's being pragmatic in the circumstances, yeah? So I don't know whether that answers your question, Inga. Um, it clearly doesn't, looking at Inga's face. No. <laughs> <laughs> but but she, she was looking like that when we were speaking earlier on. Yeah, we, we would like to make it pretty broad, wouldn't we? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Katie's got the sorry, I've got a microphone. Oh, and, and people that don't know me, I'm Katie Hudson. I'm the public interest official receiver. So <laughs> this is quite close to my heart. Um, kind of moving on from what you were saying, I was going to call it a public interest administration, your proposal. Um, but going back to Inga's paper last year, she made the point quite clearly that at the moment, government policy is that they don't want a private IP to take these kind of cases that they're funding them, and that's why they're being wound up with the official receivers. So if that was going to have legs, it would really need a change in government thinking about who they're willing to fund as office holder. Well, I suppose you could... Um, I would have thought, I mean, perhaps... I mean, not, it's not for me to tell the government what their policy should be, but I would have thought they were trying to get, use the expertise that are out there in the sense that if you've got the OR appointed, like you had in, in British Steel, you've got the need to have special managers appointed. So you're getting people from the private world, if you like, in any way. So why not have them in as administrator and possibly use that maybe the expertise more efficiently? I mean, I mean I'm not privy to how things work with you know, the OR and then special managers, but it, says, it seems to me in my naive way there could be some savings if you didn't have the two parties sort of working in that type of situation. But we've, we've, we've thought about it, and we, we also thought that, you know, you could have almost the default position that the OR does become the administrator of the company if there's nobody else willing to take it up. But I think there would be people willing to take it up because there would be an indemnity there. Uh, and we should have called it public interest administration. It would have yes. been much better. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think we're about on time. One more, one more question, Paul. Oh, if somebody will give him a microphone. Oh, I'm trying to keep it from him. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I can give my question. Okay. Okay. No, no. 
<laughs> Sorry. Uh, perhaps rather like your paper, I'm not sure I've fully thought through my question, but I'll try. And we've thought through <laughs> our paper, Paul. Don't misunderstand <laughs> what we're saying. How dare you think we haven't thought it through? It was nearly a label. So, uh, special administration regimes, uh, special administrations, uh, public interest, there's lots of stuff through all of that. And uh, I guess it's, it's more about your thoughts about where the legislation should go in relation to all of that, whether it should actually have a rethink and produce something separate, or can it just build on what we've already got? Because actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure it's not been working, because we've managed to find a way to work it, but is there a need for a rethink for all of these? Mm -hmm. Not forgetting, of course, that we have, what, 22 special administration regimes at the moment and counting. Um, yeah, so um, I, I think we're in no way sort of suggesting that the, the way in which the system is working now isn't an entirely sort of reasonable and appropriate thing to do. We're just, I think we're just suggesting there might be a more logical way of structuring the law to fit the, the circumstances more. So administration, some form of public interest administration, um, might be a better bet in terms of um, its design for the types of company we're talking about, where there isn't already a special administration in, uh, regime in place. And also, to add to that, the, the, the point I was trying to make, but obviously what Pete said, I, I completely failed, that liquidation isn't built in that, it really built for this, that it's, it's, it's not really built for the type of work that's being called into, into play. So although there's um, been judicial creativity around that, we don't think it's necessarily making good law that we're stretching the bounds of compulsory liquidation in those terms. Even though, as I said, what, what the judges did in the cases of order was, was, was probably the, the right thing to do, mm. taking into account circumstances, yes. Okay. We've ended, we've ended on a bit of a damp we're, squib we're, there, haven't we? We've, we've done very well at keeping to time, <laughs> despite the double act. Well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for answering. Professor.